Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California. You're listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ollie Alanius. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Unsugarcoated with Alia. I'm so happy to be with you here and continue to bring you incredible conversations with amazing people. Uh, it seems very simple when I say that, by the way. Incredible, amazing. I don't really feel like these words work, but uh, you'll you'll soon figure out why I say this. Today's topic is actually on the power of play, gaming. Now, I know that there's a lot of maybe wives and parents out there who are not the biggest fans of games, but turns out there is an incredible social impact taking place that you need to know about And whether you're aware of it or not, increasingly at the forefront of 21st century philanthropy is gaming. Gaming charity credentials first started to emerge in 2003 when the creators of Penny Arcade, a webcomic about the gaming industry, decided to challenge a media narrative that linked playing games with real life violence. They set up an Amazon wish list for Seattle Children's Hospital and encouraged gamers to donate. They ended up raising $250,000 in under a month and spawned a new charity, Child's Play. Since then, Child's Play has raised more than $46 million and now supports a network of more than 180 children's hospitals worldwide. It also funds staff who help with therapeutic initiatives such as providing VR headsets to children undergoing chemotherapy. And it's largely thanks to having been one of the earliest charities involved with live streaming gaming. Live stream gaming. The global pandemic has required us to change how we interact with one another, and video games have become an important touchstone for keeping audiences around the world connected. And as I've learned more and more about the incredible stories within the gaming community, I felt it important to share it with you. One of the stories I'd like to share with you is a personal one that started. I found out about a year ago. I learned of a young man named Jason Docton. Jason Docton was a gamer, and he had decided that he wanted to take his life. And because of his kind of personal spiritual beliefs, he decided that it had to be a quid quo pro. If he was going to take his life, he needed to save another one. And so through the c- gaming community, he actually said, I'm going to find someone who's I'm going to help them, and then that way I'll have a clear conscience. Sounds interesting, right? And I'm sure it really was. He went through this journey and eventually within his gaming community, he did find someone that he was able to convince, you know, life is worth living and here, let me point you in the direction of resources. And that person ultimately decided at that moment in time to not take their life. And Jason, in turn, decided that, the, you know, just being in that mission made him say, well, I now don't want to take my life anymore. Why would I want to take my life? And so he started an entire organization that is focused on providing mental health services to the gaming community, college students. And so that was kind of my first experience in really hearing the impact. Um, And so I think that there's a lot of questions that need to be addressed as far as who really is playing these games. And I think that when you guys take a moment, you're going to learn that some of the stereotypes you may have formed around the idea, we're going to get the opportunity to shatter them. The other thing is, you know, just learning about how gaming is using their abilities to raise incredible amounts of money for good causes. And technically on the line of, in in the line of social impact, technology in nonprofits, uh, you know, gaming is becoming the latest big charity revenue stream. And a lot of times nonprofits are known to lack the technological information, knowledge, wherewithal that can actually move them forward. And I mean, I love nonprofits. Unsugarcoated Media is a 501c3. But at the end of the day, if you don't have revenue, if you don't have funding, you're not going to be able to do much. So with the intent of learning and bringing about this information and, and sharing with you the importance of philanthropy and social impact through these channels, I decided to bring on two incredible guests who are both doing phenomenal things in their industries with personal backstories that are just as tremendous. I cannot wait for you to meet them. So let's get started. First off, Dina McCowie is the founder of Style and Resilience LLC, an impact-driven strategy and consulting company focusing on corporate social responsibility, strategic partnerships, impact investing consulting, as well as using marketing and PR for social good. Dina works with family offices and funds on identifying projects that have impact on the economy as well as for humanity. 
Dina has advised several United Nations agencies and has worked with the private sector to create strategic communication strategies and partnerships. She was chosen to moderate and create a strategic vision towards peace on International Day of Peace 2016, serving as a bridge for multinational companies in the United States, as well as the MENA and GCC. She believes in the power of investing in human capital. Also the co-founder of a mobile gaming studio, Thunder Pixel, which is a collection of award-winning creators with a shared goal of developing exciting and fun pop culture themed games, Thunder Pixel is set to use mobile games to impact users. Then we have Greg Zanone, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and founder of CE and CEO of Joint Forces Initiative, ROI Collabs Foundation, and Trust BV. Impact driven with deep experience and strategy within the gaming, blockchain, and the charity space, he has built a bridge by way of relationships and trust over the last 14 years in the United States and Africa. Greg got his start in the gaming world with Pros vs. GI Joes, an initiative designed to connect members of the military with professional athletes for bouts of online gaming. The idea was to create an impactful experience for those in active service. This branched into further initiatives like the Wounded Warrior Project, Purpose Driven Rehab, and the Pros vs. GI's Joe's Salute. RI Collab Foundation is the chain of digital studios in Africa and in underprivileged communities in America that aims to foster economic independence in the digital landscape. Here to have these conversations with me and also ROI Collabs addresses the problem with underprivileged communities having less opportunity for traditional work by offering programs for the music production, gaming, streaming, and digital art. So sorry about that. I'm very happy to have them both. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dina McCowie and Greg Zanoni. Well, you guys gave me a mouthful there. <laughs> Literally not like to be. You guys have done such impressive things. I'm so happy to have you both here today. I appreciate you. I kind of want to start. Greg, where are you talking to us from today? I'm at home. Come on, like everybody, we're always at home, right? So I'm at home. I built a little little studio in in one of my rooms. Um, it's makeshift. You can see in the background there's some some problems uh, that I'm having putting some of this styrofoam up. But I'm calling from Newport Beach, just my home in California. That's awesome. And Dina, how are you? Where are you talking to us from today? I am in New York in my home as well. Well, mm -hmm. I I mean, yeah, and I'm in LA. So, you know, we're all like, I feel close, but yet far. We've been on Clubhouse. We got to know each other on Clubhouse. and We won't open that can of worms right now. <laughs> but because I swear people are going to think that I work for them. But <laughs> I'm so happy to meet you both and to learn about what you're doing. I kind of want to start first with going to Dina. I think that you have an incredible story. You're this young, brilliant woman. We talked about it. You were chosen to moderate and, and, and work on a strategic vision towards peace with the United Nations. Um, kind of starting the conversation circused around, cer uh, centered around your story first. I promise I can talk. Mm -hmm. How did it feel to have that opportunity, especially having your multicultural background? It was, I mean, first of all, thank you for um, creating this space. I always say, um, you know, when people are thinking the speakers is just as important for individuals like you that create this space to then disseminate and highlight people. So just thank you for always creating this amazing space. So, um, and thank you for having me. So, you know, I think when I started my uh, journey and my company briefly, um, you know, it was because of, I, I saw the lack of uh, diversity and the lack of the appropriate narrative of, you know, what it looks like and what it sounds like in terms of storytelling of what it means to be an Arab American. And this is before, you know, diversity was such a big thing. And this is before Instagram and social media. And, um, you know, that was my driving force. And, you know, I ran for Miss Arab USA 2013, um, right when I discovered my purpose. Um, you know, I was working at Oprah magazine and I decided to start my own company because I knew that if I wanted to see these projects that have impact or the narratives, I knew that I had to be at the forefront of it. And the United Nations, um, you know, I was chosen to represent an organization there. This is about eight years now. Um, from there, I co-chaired several uh, committees. And um, the UN for me was a place that you were able to, as youth, be at the forefront. And, you know, it was it was a powerful um, 
uh, moment for me. And it kind of gave me a roadmap of where I kind of wanted to continue my journey. And I can only imagine it started off so well. And I love how you represent and I love that you were able to throw in some more information about yourself and what you've done. Because again, I would have been there all morning giving the the bio because you guys have done such incredible things. Um, You know, both of you, I do want to ask, you know, you're now with the project with the Thunder Pixel Games. And I'd love for you to just kind of share a snippet about how that journey started for you. And I know that you've spoken to the fact that you want, you know, that it is largely um, or it's creatively, it is intended to creatively <laughs> leverage pop culture characters with an impact driven approach. So mm-hmm. how, how are you leading that strategy within um, Thunder Pixel? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting, because whenever I tell somebody that I'm a co founder of a gaming studio, they they're like, how did that even happen? Like, it seems very random. Like, I'll be honest, I used to play games, uh, I have a brother and I played games when I was young. And But I never grew up wanting to work in the gaming space. Um, It kind of organically happened that way. And when I talk to entrepreneurs, I always say, you know, um, in order for you not to be all over the place, I say, start with something, be an expert in it, and you'll find yourself later on um, being able to really diversify yourself and diversify the areas in which you're um, working in. And that's what kind of happened. This is a few years back. Um, uh, my co-founder, Eric, uh, you know, we were always in touch. And now he's a friend of mine, a co-founder and a mentor. And we were just chatting in the beginning. He was like, he saw that I'm starting to work a lot with investors and traveling to Monaco with, you know, just very wealthy individuals. And in the beginning, it was more of like, hey, you know, if you find us investors, we'll give you equity. And I was just like, okay, this, that's cool. And, and, and so I started really understanding the model more and the future plans for the titles. And then I just started having cool ideas. Like I literally just was like sitting down with them. I was like, what if the future titles include this? What if this, you know, this character, this next celebrity, we could do a game with them. And I think in, in within a week, he was like, okay, you're a co-founder. I'm like, that's, that's a little crazy. So he's like, you basically kind of asked for it without asking for it. So that's just how um, the journey started in in terms of um, being a co-founder for Thunder Pixel Games. But, um, you know, I think for me, first of all, I'm the only female uh, on the team, which I, I take very seriously, because the more I'm familiar with the lack of females in this space, it, it's very interesting. So and I'm only I'm the only one with I don't want to say, I mean, they've all done amazing work, just not specifically from an impact background. So we've had these conversations a lot where, you know, in, while we're working with these titles, we all kind of agree to kind of be able to incorporate some sort of creative impact driven approach to it. So that's where I'm, I'm excited. Um, what I'm excited for. I'm excited too. And it should be noted that the co-founder, your co-founder is actually one of the people behind Call of Duty, correct? Oh, yeah. Chance Glasgow. Yeah, he co-created Call of Duty. Um, So he's just a humble, creative uh, individual. And and we're excited for that. (laughs) Sounds like everyone I've met in the gaming industry so far, like just cool, this cool community. Really quick. So I'm going to kind of start the conversation and I'm going to kick it over to Greg to kind of throw in his background as well. But I, I saw this statement in kind of doing the research for this nation of gamers are people that believe in the power of play. No matter who you are or where you're from, there's a game for everyone. And when I saw that, it just, it was very impactful. It was very inclusive. So Greg, you are doing incredible things within the gaming industry. What are your thoughts on that? And in in response, please share with us how you, you know, how you've really started this journey with combining game and social, gaming and social impact. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a few, uh, a firm believer on play, right? <laughs> you have to have fun. That's what's that's what spurs creativity. And just a little side note on chance. Uh, Dina, I don't know if you know, but how I started Progress GI Joe, I needed to know online gaming. So my neighbor was Chance. So he was working with Activision at the time and I went yeah. to his house and he was the first he was like, no, 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 no. We can't go online to guys in Iraq. That just doesn't happen. I work with the game. I can't, it's just not gonna happen. So he said, all right, we got we got the Pentagon approval to get some internet, and we were in his house sitting there, and I was like, all right, let's try. So we tried to connect, and we tried a few times, and finally that little guy appeared, and we were connected with the guys. In, wow. In so oh, my. 
I became good friends with Chance uh, over the years. But yeah, that's when it started. That was back in 2006. Wow. Living in the Valley. I, I don't know if you remember, just a side note. It just hit me while they were doing your background. We connected on Clubhouse. Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember. <laughs> I, went, I went back and forth with Grady a few times. The beauty of Clubhouse, right? Right. And, okay. You're, this is your so. <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a wild thing. So Chance actually got, well, he was one of the, the things that got us started, connected with the guys in Iraq, which was a huge thing. Um, but again, I am a firm believer in play. Uh, but play within any organization, right? In order to play, you can't have a real a serious thing. I was actually just talking to somebody about about the importance of play yesterday at my kid's soccer game. Uh, and I know a lot of professional athletes. We work with a lot of professional athletes. And I don't want to name names, but when the Patriots are a great example, great team, win Super Bowls left and right, but it's a very, very serious style of coaching, right? So not necessarily play. So, of course, they win. But when you have play and you have fun, you have creativity. So there's a lot of that. Now, fortunately, they're they're coached by the best of them. So regardless of play and creativity, they're going to win. Um, but with us, there's been so many things that we just played around with um, that spurred that creativity, which got us to where we are now, um, which is all just to create impact in the gaming space, right? I'm right with you. I started not, I wasn't a gamer. You know, I played games when I played football and it was fun playing with the team, but I wasn't a gamer. But that's the beauty behind today's technology and today's gaming space is you need people that haven't played the game. It's not necessarily every just a gamer. It was like that five, six years ago. But then the space decided to open itself up and say, okay, let's get bigger, right? Let's, let's open this space up to not just hardcore gamers. But people that can help this space. And that's where we are today. I mean, a multi billion dollar industry is because not only gamers are involved, but people that can help help the gamers get to where they are. Um, but yeah, we, we're doing a lot around the world, um, but everything just like you is impact driven. And I think that's important. Um, just to, and I don't want to go so far off topic, but one of the a few, few things that really hit on me was uh, the gaming space is raising a ton of money. I mean, a ton of money. The problem that I have with it is the organization, some of the organizations that the money is going to, right? You never know where that money is going to uh, because charities, number one, there's a lot of good ones out there. We're a charity, we're a foundation, but there's a lot of scams out there too. You know, let's let's build a charity to, to give myself the, uh, the biggest uh, salary. Um, so our thing is making sure that we kind of sidestep that and bring our impact right with us so we know exactly where that impact is going to go. Um, but obviously money is, is needed, but I'd like to see the gaming space get more involved in the charities, like actually go to the hospitals. Let's see some of these kids with cancer. Let's do, let's go to Africa. Let's go to the streets in Chicago. Let's, let's do that more as opposed to just raising money. But we're in the infancy. Um, raising money is a good start. Uh, raising a, a lot of money is a great start, but I'd like to see that kind of transition to not only Dina, you make an, an impact. We're making an impact. We're all making, you know, some of the ones that are focused on that, making an impact. Let's make it to where the gaming community are on the streets and actually doing stuff uh, for the community. I totally agree. I want to kind of step back because um, you brought up so many points. And as far as breaking some of the stereotypes, I have a couple statistics I'd like to share with the audience, you know, based on around who is playing video games and the benefits. So according to an ESA uh, survey, which ESA conducts surveys, they really study the impact of gaming in depth. And in 2020, they determined a few things such as 35 to 44 is the average age range of a video game player in the United States, which I think is interesting because it shatters that notion that it's only kids. Uh, 75% of Americans have at least one video game player in their household. Approximately 46 million video game players have disabilities. And that 80% of people polled did it for mental stimulation, 79% for relaxation, and that ultimately also more than 214 million video game players exist within the United States. So when you guys have uh, people kind of dismiss the gaming industry or kind of try to minimize it, what is your response to that? As people in the industries making, you know, seeing it on the front lines and being part of that, the change and technology. Dina, you can go first. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, even I don't know if you mentioned it, but yeah, the uh, study shown that it also helps with mental health, um, um, you know, issues as well. And it's kind of a form of, um, you know, being able to decompress. So I, I really think, um, you know, I don't want to say depends on the kind of games that you're playing, but I think it can be therapeutic. Um, you know, of course, with with everything, with people who say, you know, um, have anything to say about that with it's just like anything. Social media is great. But if you consume too much of it, you know, too much of anything is not always great. So I think um, being able to kind of um, allow that um, time for yourself to kind of, um, you know, be able to decompress and also creativity. Look at, you know, where I mean, I'm a co-founder of a gaming studio now. Yes, I never... I played games when I was younger, but you never know. You could create, you could make a career out of it as well. So I really think looking at it from a perspective of, you know, being able to play games and then even thinking that you can one day be um, the a developer or like Chance or a creator or a co-founder. So, or even just simply enjoying that time for yourself. So I really think w- whichever aspect uh, you're looking at it from, I think it can be looked at from that kind of lens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like to add to that. I, we have, I have it here too, according to the study as well. I mean, benefits according to players say that gaming have a, po- has a positive impact on their lives in these different ways. The mental stimulation, it brings joys through, brings joy through play. It helps families spend time together in some cases, cause some do get on there and, you know, um, and then also it helps people learn, um, uh, to build problem solving skills. So, you know, Greg, for you, when people kind of, you know, especially like I kind of jokingly said, when wives and parents are like, get off the game. I mean, what's your thought? Uh, first of all, I, I get that all the time. Trust me, with parents, I mean, I've been in the gaming space for 14 years and I have to educate parents, but it is all a matter of educating, right? You know, there was two two examples that come to mind and, and you, know, you brought up one of them. But one was, I think, about 10 years ago, when Call of Duty started really picking up and we were playing Call of Duty with our, all our NFL teams and NBA teams, they were taking Call of Duty out of the PX. So the PX is the store that's on military bases because the experts were saying that Call of Duty was bad for PTSD, right? And that would, they were pulling it off shelves and people in the military shouldn't be playing this game because it spurs, you know, uh, issues that they were having. Um, and then four years afterwards, now it's it's actually being it's it's a game that's it's being played for people with PTSD to get back into the action in their own environment, and now it's a positive change, right? So we can I mean that's a big 180, right? Before COVID hit is the second example. Before COVID hit, the World Health Organization put out that that video games are bad, right? You can't play too many video games. It's a bad thing. They actually had they said it was a um, they they called it not not a disease. They called it something that was similar to a, an issue. Uh, and then COVID hit, and they come out with is a complete 180. They said your kids should be playing video games, right? They partnered with Activision. They're doing a big campaign because something happened that that allowed them to take the negativity off and kind of see what the video games really does. And it was, I mean, that's a 180. The World Health Organization saying no, it's bad to the point where it's almost a disease and an issue to. Your kids should be playing more video games, right? That's a big thing, but it all comes down to education. Parents, too. I, my, my kids, he's playing a lot of video games, and the parents kind of think video games are the worst thing in the world. But my thing is, have you ever sat down with your, video, with your kid and just watched it? Have you ever heard him play and has a whole new friend group out there? Have you ever done that? You'd watch him play football. You'd watch him play soccer. You'd watch him do all these other sports. Why wouldn't you just watch and play a video game? Because they don't think video game is anything but a waste of time. Now they're seeing the differences. And now parents are kind of, you know, they're getting into it where they said they're, they're just understanding the benefits. So it really comes down to just education and just taking that, that natural instinct of, of video games or TikTok or any of this is a waste of time and just giving it a chance, seeing what positives that can come with it. And then just kind of, because once you do and you kind of settle down in that negative way, um, you see the positives. And with gaming, there's so many positives in every area that, that we do and, you know, kids across Africa. Like, there's just so many positives that video games can bring. And, you know, so many, uh, you know, like Dina said, I mean, there's, look, in the video game industry, there's so many different things that the kids can do nowadays 
um, that they're experts at that they love doing, and then can make a career out of it. So again, all about educating. Um, and you know, as video games progress, people are going to be more educated on the positives of it. Uh, and then everything's going to be changing, just like the World Health Organization. I love that you said that, and I don't want to miss out on going back. So I know you, we, we showed him in the intro for our visual audience, but you combined gaming with the military and you were speaking to that. I, I really don't want to miss the opportunity to say, how is that? How are these young, how, you know, for the person out there thinking about the, the person, the, the person defending our country, whatever branch of government that they're in, they're out remote, they have limited, you know, things like this. How have you seen gaming make an impact for, you know, soldiers, veterans, like you said, I mean, you've, you've been out there on, on the front lines. How have you seen that impact? Yeah, it, it's been a long time. So things change, right? At first, it was we were connecting them with their favorite professional athletes. So that's what it was about, right? It's, it's, and the video game was just a catalyst to kind of make that connection. And they just had a blast with it. Because when you're playing a video game, it doesn't matter who you're playing with. Once five minutes into the game, it's almost like you're playing your buddy in the basement. So back in the day, back in 2007, 2008, it was all about that connection. But now it's so different because the kids, or I shouldn't say kids, but now 17, 18, it's, it's the age that they grew up in. It's video games are very different for me that's 43 years old. That was just something to do. And a, a kid like my kid that's 8 to 10 years old, that's just taken advantage of that technology and that gaming experience in a totally different way of just having fun. I mean, the social structure, all that stuff. So nowadays, with with the mil- in terms of the military, it's it's there. It's an outlet number one um, for PTSD. It's a huge, huge deal because it is getting them back to um, combat situations and bad situations that they're in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, in, in the comfort of their home, home home, which is a big deal. Um, but also because it is something that they just love, they grew up on, they love, and it, the positives that come up, that, that come out of something that you just love doing and you're able to do in different ways is just a huge thing. So video games will always be part of the military. We're working with the Pentagon on, on you know, in video games in five years, no doubt will be an MOS um, in the military. You can actually join uh, the military, I guarantee, in less than five years to be an esports player, guarantee it. Uh, we were actually talking with the Under Secretary of the Army about that, which was a joke at first. Um, but in, in terms of the military, I mean, there's kids that were that were just playing video games that are now our best drone pilots, right? There's so many positives of it, and these they're they're so young. So it, video games is just a, a bigger part of these kids' lives than it was for us. So they it's integrating that into everyday life is just such a big deal. That's incredible. And it, when you said esports, it reminded me of my 15 year old son because he just came into the kitchen the other day and said, Mom, I signed up for this esports thing with school. And I'm Perfect. like, Good, do it. You know, I, I, I have to say, like you said, education is, is I want to empower my son no matter what age. And, and, you know, so it's very interesting. And I will say, even like my, my husband, my husband now is, is his stepfather. And when even we've talked about getting a game so they can game together, I think that for a lot of people's, people they they forget it's it is the bond of the experience don't focus on the game focus on the the outcome of what's happening in 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 those moments which brings me to another thought and dina i'm curious to hear your input on this gaming to me it is said that most games you're actually playing with another person and because they use the headphones i i laugh like now that we're on clubhouse the gamers all have like their professional headgear right do you think that another reason gaming is as powerful like and you know, people can go back and watch the last episode if they want to learn more about Clubhouse. But Clubhouse is an app that's focused on audio, right? And we're we're seeing in real time once again that experiment how voice brings us together more so than just text or comments. Do you feel that within the gaming industry, that's also a, a benefit where it's been already ahead of that? Like these these young people and gamers are already communicating in voice, and it's just so much more powerful. Yes, I actually, so my brother, I mean, he's a huge gamer. And when he used to live with us when we were younger, I used to, I, I remember he would just be so competitive. I'm like, who is he like on the phone? With? Like, who is he? He's like, you know, I'm talking to somebody from like Africa or Egypt or and I always thought that was so fascinating. You know, it was just like, you know, I think they they definitely were way ahead. I mean, now, you know, you see Clubhouse and audio only platform. It gives it 
a sense of, you know, um, connectivity. And, you know, I was actually speaking with my brother and his uh, friend just a month ago, um, you know, and I think, Alia, you mentioned it, but I think there's something already out there. But, it, you know, I just started thinking, I'm like, you know, like you see all these guys and men, but this is a whole other conversation. You know, the idea of um, toxic masculinity and how men are afraid to share their emotions. And that's why they're, you know, usually um, kind of, it's, there's a lot of stigma around mental health issues around for boys and, and men. And I'm like, what if there's an initiative? I promise you, this is before I knew it, maybe it already exists, but I'm like, what if there's something that unites and connects men through where they're, they are already at, like in gaming, like when they're talking about, oh, you see that shot and basketball and all that, because, you know, they all, I guess they all just talk, you know, about like, what's happening currently in gaming and sometimes they talk about other things but i'm like what if there's like this cool movement where men can and boys can actually log on and just talk about like what's happening in their life so it's 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 a powerful tool for sure yeah i feel like for them that is the way that i know women and men and, and mask it's like my son will sit down down next to a grown man i guarantee you greg if you met my son he'll talk with you sports like I've seen him go into a barbershop and start speaking to grown men that he does not know about sports in a way that I'm genuinely impressed, you know, kind of also yeah. made me say, you better not be late on that homework. I know you <laughs> like, it gave me, he's, he's like, I can pull out any stat and, and he's learned this from, from, from gaming. It's helped him. It's, and my, by the way, my son is also dyslexic. So, you know, talking about that and how that makes them feel connected in a different way. I love it. So now moving into the how you brought up a great point on all the things that can happen. And, you know, Greg, you spoke about it earlier, they are raising a lot of money for some of the people who might be interested in tapping into the, you know, the gaming world and understanding how to connect it with their social causes or movements. How do you see that happening? And how do you feel it's the best way? And I mean, each of you can and can answer this based on your own experience. But um, Greg, please feel free to go first. I think it's different. For you, are you talking about every organization or company just trying to tap into the gaming space? Yeah, I mean, just if you're, if you, like, for example, if I'm unsugarcoated media and I'm thinking, wow, the gaming community is really great. They're doing social causes. How can I approach a gaming studio to potentially collaborate with? What is it that really stands out for? Um, I mean, I, I know the answers to some degree, but I want yeah. you guys to give your answer and your perspective. Yeah, that's kind of the question. Yeah, I, I think it's different for every organization. First of all, I'm, I'm kind of, and I shouldn't say get bothered by, but some organizations, some companies have no right or no no need to get in somewhere they, they just don't know. Um, and the gaming space is one of those that were created by gamers, for gamers, you know, obviously other people coming in and helping that out. But when I see companies, individuals, whatever it is, trying to just take advantage of a space or an individual just for personal gain, I, th I, I have a hard time with that, right? You know, and if, if, they, if they don't have any gamers on staff or, or anything, yeah, of course, gamers can, you know, you know, gamers can raise money for their organization. But listen, you can't get involved in every single facet of the world just to raise money or just to get your visibility out there. For me, it just got to be, it got to be natural. It got to be organic. Um, so if there's organizations that, that, yeah, they have some gamers on staff, they do, of course, that everybody knows there's a lot of money in gaming, right? But that, again, it doesn't mean that everybody should be involved just because there's a lot of money. And I just have a hard time when, when companies come in and just trying to take advantage of the space, um, just for the money, right? So, but. With that said, uh, organizations that that are do want to be involved, you know, and I've worked with a few charities, um, the Jay Coughlin Foundation, uh, a few other charities that are trying to get into the gaming space. I think streaming is the way to go. Um, you get a bunch of streamers to stream for you, and visibility. If it's just money you're looking for, you know, then obviously uh, getting the word out. But I would, I would, I personally would like a lot of companies, a lot of organizations getting into the gaming space to just try to, just like the NFL and the NBA do. Right. Try to get the gamers, try to get the people that are in the space, actually one on one with the people in need, um, whether it's a kid with cancer or someone in homeless. So let, let's let's have a kind of a movement to where it's not just a matter of money. Um, let's let's get some of these companies to get the gaming space to kind of push agendas forward um, in terms of actually making real impact instead of just throwing money at it. But again, uh, you know, streaming is a great way to go for organizations and 
and companies to raise a lot of money and get visibility out there for their product. There's no no doubt about that. Um, so I think obviously if a company wants to get involved, getting with the studios is kind of tough, uh, unless you have those relationships, but getting with a streamer, there's so many out there. Um, so the visibility of your product or organization out there, I think that's for sure the, the, the easiest way to go, uh, to get some streamers on board to kind of support you if they, if they want to support, um, what you're trying to do. I love that you said that before, Dina, before, you know, I, I, Greg, thank you for being unsugarcoated about it. Because it is very, very important for people to understand the difference. And we talk actually a lot about what's going on right now. You have all these people that have a lot of expectations. What can I get? What can I get? Without really willing to give, right? We, we, we've been having this big conversation on Clubhouse about social digital currency. I answer questions to people who say, you know, I've put up my business on Instagram and nobody's liking, nobody's, we're not seeing this growth. It's like, okay, but what are you doing? What are you giving back to the community of which you're seeking some sort of gain from, you know? And so I really appreciate that you said that. And I want to just, you know, applaud you for that because it's a very critical part of the process. But for people who are um, into it, I think it's important for them to, to understand and, and um, look into different ways and resourceful ways that we can. And and like I said earlier, technology is something where nonprofits often don't dive into. So Dina, what were your thoughts on that from before? So I definitely agree with Greg. Actually, we were, um, approached by a nonprofit. Um, I mean, a few times, but one particular nonprofit, they're a very known mom- nonprofit, actually. And that exactly happened. They were like, hey, we see you're a co-founder of a gaming studio. We don't know anything about it, but we know we want to get into it. I'm like, so how would you like us to help you? Would you want me to consult you? Like, that's a whole other, con- like, that's the thing. It's like, it's, you you could tell they were trying to take advantage. So the next step is like, if you genuinely, genuinely want to further your nonprofit efforts, create a budget. So Chance, what he also does, I don't know if you know this, he works with um, a, a global nonprofit. Uh, they're actually very well known. They're, they're using gaming for social impact and he's advising them, right? So actually have a professional and have a budget where you could actually come in and get somebody like Chance to advise you, right? So... And if I, I would suggest if that, you know, any nonprofit or, or company is not familiar with that space, I think to take that step of hiring a professional developer or somebody who's like an expert in the gaming space and has done it already to kind of advise you on strategy and all that is a perfect way. Um, but other than that, yeah, the approach of that not other nonprofit was literally a perfect example of trying to um, kind of like an opportunist, like, okay, we don't know anything. We don't want to pay. Like, we don't know it. We don't have a budget. So like, it was literally that I'm like, do you guys want me to give you chance? I don't know if he has a time, but maybe he'll consult you. Well, we don't have really like a big budget. So it's like, I, I, I love nonprofits, but Just you know, show that, the money. That's it. They yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, that's the thing. Like, it's like, I've worked in both spaces, right? Like, it's uh, it's like they expect things without putting something up front. And I get it. Every nonprofit is in different, you know, stages of fundraising. But if you're a decent sized uh, nonprofit, you have a budget. So if you can't allocate that budget for what you're currently trying to, you know, new program or new initiative, then I don't expect anything, especially if you're going for the big guys or a big name. So <laughs> it was just like an interesting experience. You know, I think it's, there's always room to, you know, incorporate and kind of, you know, move along with, I don't want to say the trend, but if it has to be authentic, like Greg, like Greg said, like that was literally a perfect example of something that like, we totally weren't really interested in. Again, maybe later on, if we want to, um, you know, uh, donate to like a charity, we'll keep them in mind. But other than that, it was, it was literally the perfect example of a nonprofit having no idea about the gaming space, but just kind of wanted to help on the bandwagon. So, yeah, that's, that's it, definitely. And, and to really, I think what's been so interesting from my perspective is to learn the ways, uh, in which the impact is being created. Greg, you provide aid to street artists and people without education in the digital arts by giving them classes, connections, and financial support until they can support themselves. Can you talk a bit about how you do this and on that journey for you? 
Yeah, so we, uh, obviously, we were heavy into the military, right? But we had so many good relationships, we decided that we need to, to, you know, there's military organizations out there that can do what we do. I mean, it's just setting up a video game with professional athletes, celebrities, influencers, anyone can do it. Uh, we wanted to utilize uh, our relationships just for more good because, again, uh, we saw a problem and, you know, something that bothered us in a, in a big way. And that's that everybody thought gaming is for everyone. Now, that sounds really nice, right? And anybody could pick up a game and anyone could play a game. But unfortunately, that's just that's just not reality. Um, the kids in the project, kids on the streets, they don't have the ability to sit down and play a video game. They don't have the money for the video game. Maybe there's, there's issues at home that don't allow any of the gaming. Whatever the case is, gaming is not for everyone like people are trying to say. Um, so we try to make sure that we kind of fill in those gaps. Um, to where we do make it to where gaming is going to be. So going straight to the projects or going, you know, I grew up in Jersey, going straight to the projects. Uh, Chicago, we're going to be in Chicago next week. Um, just giving the opportunities that are in the gaming space and now on the blockchain NFT space, but just bringing the accessibility like people say is reality, just making that reality for people on the streets. And, and that is in the gaming space. And it's not just playing a video game, but it could be photography, artwork. You know, there's so many things that the gaming space fortunately created a whole entire industry. So anybody on the street, you go into streets of Chicago, South Chicago, and nine time, nine people out of ten, there there can be something that they can do in the gaming space. Uh, unfortunately, they just don't know the opportunities are there that are there, right? You know, we work with an organization called Chicago Cred, and, and we were going to do uh, well, we are doing a studio in Chicago, and we brought in some of the guys from Chicago Cred. Um, and they were former, former in prison, right? You know, some guys that were in prison and, you know, they came and, uh, they looked at what we were about to give them and they looked, they looked, just looked puzzled, right? And we were saying, you know, what's going on? She goes, and they, the whole group of them said, you don't understand. This is, this is for us. This opportunity is for us. And that to me is just that right there makes the impact on making sure that we keep, we continue this. Because, yeah, of course it is for you. Why wouldn't it be for you? You know, gaming is supposed to be for everyone. So people on the street, people coming out of prison, you know, there's a lot of people that don't even know that these opportunities exist. And even if they did know that they exist, they didn't know they exist for them. And that's the problem with these poor areas and, and these rough areas, not only in Chicago, but all over the world, is Maybe the opportunities are known, but they don't, they don't know that they can, they can access. Them. So we just make sure that we fill in those gaps and bring that access to, to as many people as, as want, right? And just make sure that they can not only take advantage of it, but help create economic independence, which when you do that from the street and it's doing something that they love, it, it funnels down, right? It's, it now, you know, if it's one, one guy coming off the street, one girl coming off the street and doing something, it funnels down to the community. Um, you know, and that's what we try to provide, just a better environment, not only for the guys and girls on the street, but just something that they can do that they can bring back to their community and raise that community up. I love that. And the economic perspective is very, very key. I mean, we always talk about how can we really truly create systemic change and, you know, to know that you're able to empower others and, and really dive into how to, that, that, that speaks to that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny here in the States, we call it monetizing, right? We're going to monetize the gaming space, whether it's streaming or something. You look in Africa, um, and it, we're specifically um, we're focusing on the women in Africa. Um, it's not, it's it's economic independence. And what that means is they have the independence to live, right? And and unfortunately, there's a lot, there's not a lot of opportunities, but what they don't realize is the opportunity in the gaming space is completely theirs to do whatever they want with, and they can do it without having to get a job or an actual you know company job. They can do it on their own. They can raise that brand on their own, and they can create economic independence. And you know, of course, same here in the states um, because economic in, is economic independence is okay. You're you're free to live, um, but it, it you know in Africa and other parts of the world, it really is a matter of you're you're. You're doing something that you love doing in order to put food on the table and food that maybe you didn't have last week. Uh, but now that the opportunities are there for you, you have that opportunity to not only put food on the table, but build a brand to kind of raise that community. So economic independence is a big, big deal for us, especially you know focusing on the women in Africa. 
Um, but here in the States, too, it, it really is a matter of when you earn something by doing something that you love, a lot of things change. Uh, and that change you know, can be not only on the individual side, but throughout the whole community. Incredible. And Dina, uh, we'll be wrapping up shortly, but I got to hear from you from a female perspective. You know, you're, you know, he's talking about Africa. We already, you know, you're, you're Egyptian, uh, an American, you know, you, you have, you're, you're working with the United Nations and you're representative of female in the technology world, showing others you're a role model. How does that feel to you? And how are you using your platform to, you know, raise that awareness for, for females? Yeah. Um, you know, the more, so when I became a co-founder, I started doing more research about the details of like, okay, how many female founders, um, you know, in the gaming space. So, you know, I, 41%, I think around 41% of, uh, gamers are female, but, um, I, in 2019, I think 24%, um, were female game developers. So, you know, when you think about it, it's, you know, how can we, how can females take up a large percent of, of, you know, ga female gamers, but only 24% of them about are, are creating these games. So, you know, I really, I don't take it lightly that I am a, a you know, a female co-founder of a gaming studio. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for my co-founders to create that space for me. And I think, you know, we need to, you know, we need to allow more of that, you know, honestly, like, um, for men to be our allies in creating these opportunities for us or creating this space for us to even be, uh, be able to access it. And, um, you know, I definitely think that I have so many different ideas. Like I could, I could chat for, for hours, but, you know, being able to really, um, we're, we're chatting, we were chatting with the UN about, um, you know, uh, partnering on, you know, how do we raise awareness of the 17 goals of the UN, um, into gaming? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're chatting also, uh, you know, our first title, uh, is, is a boxing game. Um, can't tell who it is, but, um, privately I can, but, you know, future titles, um, you know, where I'm thinking even, you know, how can we leverage maybe more female athletes or maybe female um, uh, women in, in spaces or women of color or women minorities. So I really think for me, it's more about I'm grateful that I hold that space with my co-founders because, you know, we each bring different experiences and different, we come from different backgrounds. And I think, um, in order for, again, it's, it's all interconnected for me. Like when I, sometimes when I once thought I'm like, well, this is so random. It's really not because my mission when I started my company was, um, you know, create space and work with people who are underrepresented, whether that's advertisers or media. Well, the gaming space now it's kind of the same. Um, you know, being a female co-founder, how can I use my ideas and really, um, kind of creating this space where we're able to kind of leverage more creativity um, and, and ideas that maybe a large EA sports company wouldn't necessarily do. So I definitely think I, um, I recognize the space that I'm holding and I'm definitely excited and I'm hoping that I can um, pave the way for more female um, uh, females who want to be in the gaming space or maybe never even thought of it like me, but are inspired to, from hopefully what we do, and uh, in a few years we'll be able to see. <laughs> I think uh, you. Would. I just I just want to say one thing on on something that you hit on earlier, and you said that uh, your co-founder said, "Well, you you asked without asking." Yeah. And to me, that's just it, it's it's a little little more than that. Uh, you became it, right? You you went out and did your stuff, and you just became it, right? There was there was no way he can say no because you just yeah. became a co-founder because of your work, right? You know, and that's it's. Sometimes people say we created the space or a co founder yeah. created the he space. He tells me that all the time. Yeah, it, it's, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. You made the space, right? You made the space. You became a co founder, right? Not asked, not you, someone created it for you. And that's the beauty. You know, we see this, you know, over in Africa and, and sometimes here at home. You know, some of the people, it's, it's like, especially the women on the streets, you know, there's one in Chicago in particular. It's, we didn't give her the opportunity. She was the best for it, right? You know, it's like, right. we need you. Right. right. <laughs> further this, right. So it's 
it, it's incredible to see um, really? someone like you doing what you do and you're just creating it for you. So I, I love Thank it. You. You know, I, think, I think, you know, you could be an easy mentor to so many people. Um, you know, again, even with where I'm going to definitely recruit you for stuff in Africa for sure. <laughs> well, uh, I would love to. I mean, I was just going to tell you in. We've uh, been, we had to, I mean, I know we, we were chatting about um, connecting offline, but we definitely need to. Yeah. See, I love the work that you're doing as well. Just, <laughs> just, just don't forget about me. No, kidding. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. No, I, it's so funny. Again, like this is, I love um, what we do. I love, I get it. Monday is a, like my favorite day of the week. I can't even lie. My husband has a hard time getting me to stop working. Not because I, just because I love it. I really do love what we're doing. I don't, it doesn't feel like work. Um, I mean, it feels like work, but it doesn't feel like work. I know you guys know what I mean. Well, really quick, cause we're going to wrap it up. I do want you each to, for the listening audience, tell them where they can find you, how they can support you, Greg, uh, your handle that they can check you out. Oh man, that's a see. Isn't it crazy that I can't even tell you the handle, right? Yeah, Instagram, social media is not my is not my thing. Uh, anyone that wants to get a hold of me, you can just email me, um, gzone at rolycolab dot com. Um, but man, I gotta get better, and maybe we can recruit someone to help us with social, uh, just because we gotta get that out there. Right. Saying that I don't even know our handles is not a good thing. So you can imagine that we need that help. But yeah, anyone that uh, wants to get in touch with me. Email's good, cell phone's good, just however it takes uh, to get a hold of me, please do. Dina? Um, so, yeah, I, I'm on Instagram. It's my first name, last name, Dina McCowey on Instagram. Um, that's probably the best way. And Twitter, Dina underscore McCowey, I think. <laughs> Great. Well, regardless, on but, the episode, yeah, if you just look me up, I'm I'm probably easily on LinkedIn or um, social media. It's not that hard. So. Uh, if your if audience go to the description, and we will have their contact information in there, so don't worry. But you know, it, to the both of you, it's been an absolute pleasure. It went way too fast because there's just so much. Thank you for discussing the why, the how, the need, and and the benefits of gaming and philanthropy. I really appreciate both of your guys' knowledge. And it's just been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. you so much, Ali. And to the audience at home, thank you once again for let, you know, staying with us, hearing this conversation. I know that you got some value. I know that you're going to want to reach out to our guests and support what they're doing. Um, for us, please don't forget to subscribe, comment, and share. In the meantime, we'll see you next time. Thanks for letting us be unsugarcoated. <laughs>